I have to talk about stuff. I have to talk to So we're going to get started. Okay, we left off on paragraph 12. Oi. Oh, yes. Thank you. Did everybody sign in? No, I did not. Is there a sign in sheet? Both can be for a question. We just happened to say it. Sign of sheet and the Okay. Paragraph 12. Buyer's due diligence. Now, 
we're going to be highlighting and underlining a lot here, so pay attention. Seller uh, yes. will provide access to insurers, representatives, and as may be required by the agreement of sale or by mortgage lenders to surveyor, municipal officers, appraisers, and inspections. In addition, unless otherwise agreed, only parties and their real estate licensees may attend any inspections. You need to underline this. Why? Because you're gonna get a buyer who's gonna make a decision that grandma and grandpa, Uncle Jim, who watches four kids are coming to the inspection. This was added purposely to keep the circus home. This isn't a circus. You need to know where to find that when you have a situation. Okay, so you're going to underline, in addition, unless otherwise agreed, only parties and their real estate licensees may attend any inspection. 12-2, underline this, highlight it. Buyer may make two pre-settlement walkthrough inspections of the property for the limited purpose of determining that the condition of the property is as required by this agreement and any addenda. or addenda. Buyer's rights to these inspections are not waived by any other provision of this agreement. So you say, why am I looking at this twice, this property, instead of doing just a one-time walkthrough, pre-settlement? If your contract was of such that a lot of in, uh, repairs were going to be done, listen, who do we trust in this job? No one. No one. <laughs> If you take the conception and the idea that everyone's an ass, it's going to go a lot better for you and your client. With that said, you need to know that this work was supposed to be done. And shenanigans happen all day, every day. You have an opportunity, especially if you wrote the contract in of such that the work to be, and this is really important. Listen to what I'm saying and make it note somewhere. It is important when you draw up your uh, reply to home inspection, if you're having the seller make changes, it is important that the work be done by who? By a licensed contractor. And this is the catch. You ready? In the appropriate field. We don't want the plumber doing the electrical work. Okay. When you're dealing with a rehab, there's a GC type of situation. You have to understand that. But if it's not that kind of a transaction, you need to have the right vendor doing the right work, asking for invoices. Now, you want that done seven, 10 days prior to closing, because there's always a calamity. With that said, that gives you an opportunity to walk through with your buyer and say, here's our list. How many things you really got done? Oh, there's four still missing. And then you're gonna come back the morning of, the night before, and do your checklist again. That's the reason why there is two Walkers. Okay. No, it does. It does. But you're entitled to two. You used to just do it the day before or the morning of. Now we're entitled to a second one because so many repairs are being done by sellers. Okay. Very important, 12 grade. Seller will have heating and all utilities, including fuels on for all inspections and appraisals. If you're writing an offer for a property that the utilities are not on, it says right here, 
in bold that the seller will have on. Nobody reads that. You're, you're going to have to add it on the last page. As a reiteration, this, these utilities will be on. The appraiser, what can he do? He can't tell me if the heating's working, and that's mandated. He can't tell me if the electric's on, because that's mandated. So his job is limited. And now we're going to pay for the appraiser to come back out and say, oh, yeah, it's working now. Newer agents in this room? Note, there are some nasty people on the listing side. Many years ago, I happened to be standing at the front desk with an agent who looked at me and said, oh, I have a question. So I sold my buyer this house. We went under contract. And the selling agent said, oh, no, no, no. We're not dealing with the utility. You have to do it. As well as some of the agreements. So I had to show them where it was. And this seller agent bought this poor kid too. And now that he, I said, no. Now, this was a time when the second deposit was pretty customary, and you would give a first deposit with the offer. I said, mm -hmm. until those utilities go on, you send him notification by addendum that there will be no second deposit until they're one. The only way to get somebody's attention is in their pocketbook or their wallet. Otherwise, nobody pays any attention to anything, right? So, and listen, when you're in doubt, when you're like, you know, it just doesn't seem right, but I don't know how to handle it, it's when you pick up the phone and you call me, okay? And then we work it out together. Don't assume. You're not good enough to assume, okay? So don't do it. All right, all inspections, including home inspectors, are authorized by buyer to provide a copy of any inspection report to the broker for the buyer. Seller has a right upon request to receive a free copy of any inspection report from the party for whom it was prepared. There will be, in your lifetime, if you stay in this business long enough, to have a seller go, um, well, let me, let me just say this. The agreement of sale has been changed in that now. And you'll see this as we go down. When you do a reply to inspection, all potential, all documentation has to go with chimney report. If you had a chimney specialist, the the wood infestation, the home inspection, all documentation as a buyer's agent you have has to be sent over to the seller. And we're going to talk about that further, just to let you know, you can't hold anything back. All documentation, all reports have to go to the seller. Unless otherwise stated, underline this, highlight this, but an exclamation next to this sentence, seller does not have the right to receive a copy of any lender's appraisal report. Listen, new people. Uh, three, 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 one, three, three, three. The other side knows you're green. You know, you just bleed green. You're an eating. You just bleed green. And they know you're green. And this is how the phone call goes. Hey, Vic, how you doing? Great. Listen, I know the appraiser went through. Do me a favor. When you get two minutes, send me over the appraisal report. Okay, thanks, honey. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah. 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 I don't care what song and dance they do on that telephone. The answer is no. Okay. Buyer waves or elects the buyer's at buyer's expense to have the following inspections, certifications, and investigations referred to as inspections or inspections performed by a professional contractor, home inspector, engineer, architect, and other properly licensed or otherwise qualified professionals. All inspections shall be non-invasive unless otherwise agreed to in writing. 
What inspection would be considered invasive? Uh, correct. And why is that? Because you have to look at the, um, you have to penetrate the wall to look at the brick. So they're going to drill a hole. That's right. Of which that seller will be signing off on a form from that home inspector that they know I'm drilling a hole. Okay. If the same inspector or inspecting is inspecting more than one system, the inspector must comply with the home inspection law. See that in paragraph 12A. For elected inspections, buyer will, and pay attention to this, Sid, okay? Within the contingency period stated in paragraph 13A, now, when we talk about it for this class, we will always deal with the 17-day program. 10 days a buyer has to submit, five days a seller has a review, and then there are two additional days for a buyer to respond. It's a 17-day program, okay? Thank you. Good question. Um, because I have this come up um, to bring it to everybody else's attention, because even if we hand in our report, earlier than the end of the 10, it doesn't shorten that timeline. Yep. So we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, and that's a problem. Yeah. Many agents, when I get to this, will, even if they have everything they need from their buyer three days early, will wait to day 10. Because math, realtors can't do math. <laughs> it's not even girl math. It's no math. <laughs> Guy. And it helps to reduce confusion. So back to C. The elected inspection buyer will, within the contingency period stated in paragraph 13A, they'll complete the inspection, obtain the inspection reports or results, and they will either then accept the property, terminate this agreement or submit a written corrective proposal to the seller according to the terms of paragraph 13B. So we have choices. A buyer does inspections for knowledge. Now, is the knowledge acceptable to that buyer? And every home has a bump and bruise, but they say, I can live with these bumps and bruises. I'll take it. Okay, I'll take it. Or are they like, we love a marriage agents. I never thought that this house was in this. It looked good on surface leave, but when we started digging, boy, no, it's too much for me. I can't handle it. I'm out. <laughs> By the way, there is no reason, no explanation needed for a buyer to get out of an inspection. You don't have to go back to the seller and say it was the chimney, it was the water, it was the smell, nothing. You terminate, and that's it. There's no explanation needed. Or you're like, listen, I can look with some of this and I'll fix it, the buyer says, but some of this I really can't. So let's go back to the seller and try to figure out how we can mutually agree to accommodate these bumps and bruises. Okay. Here we go. First one's home inspection. We're either electing to do it or we're going to waive it. So whatever the choice of your buyer is, they have to initial either the elect side or the waive side. Buyer may conduct an inspection of the property's structural components, such as roof, exterior windows, exterior doors, exterior building materia, material, <laughs> excuse me, fascia, gutters, and downspouts, swimming pools, hot tubs, and spas. A home inspector does not do swimming pools, hot tubs, and spas. If you have a home with some of these luxuries, you have to hire a special inspector to do that. Know that. Appliances, electrical system, interior and exterior plumbing, public sewer systems, heating and cooling systems, water penetration, electric magnetic fields. Who here knows what an electric magnetic field is? I'm sorry? Like the dolphins? No. Mm -hmm. No. Nope. Yeah. 
because you guys now, haven't been around that long. You didn't post up the power lines. That's vicious. That was a hot thing 30 years ago. Electric magnetic field. So this cute house backs up to those 60 foot, more than that, what am I saying, 64? 160 feet electrical power lines that run right down the back of the neighborhood. I actually showed one about three months ago to my niece. I said, Danielle, just tell them you, because that's my job to tell you that there is an issue. Is it really been proven? Hmm, kind of, maybe, not firm factual, but there has been a concern that electric magnetic fields could be an influence on some forms of cancer. Well, that was it. She walked out the door and she goes on bus. But 35 years ago, oh my God, that's all we heard about was electric magnetic fields. Not so much today, clearly, because you guys don't even know what it is. But when you see these power lines that are literally 20 stories in the air, that's where it's coming from. Wetlands and flood plain delineation. When you guys are looking up properties, and you've got one that your buyer is interested in, how convenient, bright, has a tab that you click on for flood. In the last couple of years, just because I'm me, I clicked on it and went, click. Call the buyer, FYI, this is in a floodplain. They're like, what? Bridesburg, the neighborhood Bridesburg, a lot of properties are in floodplains. So pay attention to that. Uh, square footage. Now, realtors are buggers. And you'll read in bright a particular square footage. Bless you. It's a truth, say. Pay no mind to what it says. Once you go back over to the the bright site that you're looking at. And on the left hand side, in color, is the tax ID number. You click on that. And when you do that, you now see the assessor's determination of what the square footage is. A lot of times we get, oh, this house is 2,400 square feet, and then there's that little one. That's <laughs> Who estimated on what? Okay. If you're listing a property, always ask by the slimmest chance do you have your appraisal when you bought it? What professional, what two professionals, it only counts when they say what square footage is? What two professionals do we can rely on? Appraiser, uh huh. Surveyor is going to take care of the outside. An architect. And an architect. Very good. They are the only two professionals that count. Don't ask that home inspector to do it. He doesn't have the right to do it. No. So square footage is really an issue. I know of a broker who got sued over square footage. Don't play. Okay. Mold and other environmental hazards, such as fungi, indoor air quality, asbestos, underground storage tanks. Big issue. Who knows what Levittown is? Yeah. Levittown. <clears throat> now has passed, if a home is on the market and they have underground tank that had not been removed prior to their purchase, needs to be removed. They're not playing, no, no. Only maybe seven, eight years ago, it wasn't that way, but now it is. So then there's the question, I know it's a Levittown house. I know that the tank was removed. Buyer, do you still want an environmental soil testing done? Think about it. The quality of that tank when it was removed, who the heck knows? So is the soil 
in the immediate area of where that tank was contaminated. You got to bring this up. You got to think about this. And any other items buyer may select. If buyer likes to have home inspection of the property, also defined in the home inspection law, the home inspection must be performed by a full member in good standings of the National Home Inspection Association or a person supervised by a full member of the National Home Inspection Association in accordance with the ethics, standards, and codes of conduct or practice of the association or by a properly licensed or registered engineer or architect. Now, your buyer is that single girl we talked about who ended up buying grandma's house and Uncle Joe was the executor. But Uncle Joe is very handy. I mean, he built that beautiful house in Pocahontas. And she really wants Uncle Joe to do the inspection. How do we respond to this? <laughs> well, what do you mean? He built this beautiful house. What do you mean he can't do the inspection? I don't understand. First of all, we refer to the contract, right? And here it clearly says, but she's got a tear in her eye. Does Uncle Joe's her guy? He's always been there. He's always been there. <laughs> when I got that ticket on my <laughs> so how do we handle this here is a suggestion I have I appreciate you wanting on the chair there I get it he's your guy but how about we try this stay to the letter of the contract we hire a professional home inspector but how about we bring Uncle Joe let's have Uncle Joe come to so he can look and ask questions that maybe you don't know about. And it's going to make you feel better. What do you think about that? Okay, we got the licensed guy, so we're staying with the contract. We're putting sap on her wounds that she needs Uncle Joe there, right? Okay. All right. Uh, wood infestation. <laughs> Buyer may obtain in written wood destroying insect infestation insect inspection report. It's all that to say we're checking for bugs, right? From an inspector certified as a wood destroying pest pesticide applicator, and will deliver it and all supporting documents and drawings provided by the inspector to the seller. The report is to be made satisfactory to and in compliance with applicable laws mortgage lender required. Many FHAs and VAs do require, even though the buyer thinks they're waiving it, underwriting comes back and goes, no, no, no. You got to do a home inspection. So if you're dealing with a government loan, check with the loan officer if it's mandated that we have to do a wood infestation or other federally insured guaranteeing agency requirement. The inspection is to be limited to all readily visible and accessible areas of all structures on the property, except for fencing. If the inspection reveals active infestation, buyer at buyer's expense may obtain a proposal budget from a wood destroying pest, pesticide applicator to treat the property. If the inspection reveals damage from active or previous infestation, Buyer may obtain a written report from a professional contractor, home inspector, or structural engineer that is limited to structural damage to the property caused by wood destroying organisms and a proposal to repair the property. Now, those termites have to be there a while. That really, in, in real life, to cause structural issues. Termites rarely go above the first floor. Because where do they come from? The ground. So they're coming from the lower level. It is an odd day that something has been left untreated for so long that you will find them at the first floor. That happened to me one time, probably 25 years ago. The infestation had deteriorated the windowsills on the first floor. 
At that time, my buyer was using Chase. Chase said, oh, we're done. It's got terms. Couldn't get a mortgage. It was a Fishtown property. The buyer was an engineer. I forget what the wife did. We convinced the buyer's dad. You know I'm going back in time to pay the hundred thousand for the house in Fishtown. <laughs> Daddy came up to me when we were doing the walkthrough. He goes, "Tell me, please, if I get my money back." I said, "Oh, sweetheart, you're getting your money. Don't you worry." Once we closed, then they went and got a mortgage and paid Daddy back. But nobody would get near it. Okay, so when suspicious, yeah, always turn my. We're in a wet area. We're between what? Oh, yeah, two rivers. Yeah. So we're wet. Termites like moisture. Okay. Deed restrictions. Buyer may investigate easements, deed and use restrictions, including any historical preservation restrictions or ordinances that apply to the property. Pay attention. That is a question on the seller's disclosure, but we can't trust anyone. When you open up the tax records in Philadelphia, on the bottom, I think it's the bottom right, it will indicate, but don't hold me to it. Doesn't have to be 200 years old to have historical uh, historical preservational restrictions. So check. And review local zoning ordinances. Buyer may verify that the present use of the property, such as an in-law quarters, apartment, home office, daycare, commercial, or recreational vehicle car parking, short-term rentals, what's short-term rentals? Airbnb. Airbnb. Is permitted and may elect to make the agreement contingent upon an anticipated use. Present uses of what? Once we get to zoning, you know. You better know what the zoning is. I get these calls after the fact. You just fill in the gaps. Come on, guys. You have to do homework. You have to be a little private eye. You got to go in there and you got to dig. No. Find out. Go to the BRT. See how something is zoned. This thing with duplex, I go screaming in the woods every day because, well, they, they say, <laughs> when would you fill in that line? If it's a one family, but nobody does. But yeah. Okay. Yes. When you know that um, the mortgage for the fish in the house, how would you do that after the place? Wait. Didn't say anything. It was a. Uh, didn't say anything about it. But he took care of it. It really did get taken care of. He. I never got to see it, but I heard it was fascinating. He gutted. He's an engineer. He gutted the. It was on Susquehanna. Gutted the entire inside, and there were spiral steps from the inside to go around. Instead of going up and turn. No. He spiraled the entire inside. He hollered it out. I heard it was gorgeous. I never did get to say it. But whatever structural that needed to be done was just done at the time. And we knew that. And so did the loan officer. I mean, the loan officer was really involved with this. And uh, I'm trying to remember if he actually came out to the inspection. But once we figured it out, we were like, whoa. But we just refined and never told him that. Because it was conventional, not a big jack. And so all we had to do is pay daddy. Daddy went. Thank you, baby jacks. <laughs> all right. So water services. Buyer may obtain an inspection of the quality or quantity of the water system. Now, does it specify here in that short little sentence what type of water system? Technically, a buyer can have public water testing. Yes, technically. Does anybody do it? Nay, nay. But it can be. From a properly licensed or otherwise qualified water well testing company. If and as required by an inspection company, seller at seller's expense will 
locate and provide access to the on-site or individual water system. That's the well we're talking about here. Seller will restore the property to its previous condition at seller's expense prior to selling. If a property, you're accidentally in the burr of selling something and it is well water, there is no other option, but yes, you are electing to have this done. And you're like, but Vic, who's doing it? Call a KW out in the burbs near there and say, listen, who do you guys use to do your well water test? Radon. Buyer may obtain a radon test of the property from a certified inspector. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, known as EPA, advises corrective action if the average annual exposure to the radon is equal to or higher than 0 0.02 working levels or four peculiar liters, blah, blah, blah. Radon is a natural radio radioactive gas that is produced in the ground by the normal decay of uranium and radium. Studies indicate that extended exposures to high level of radon gas can increase the risk of lung cancer. Like, no kidding. Radon can find its way into air spaces and can permeate a structure. If any house has a radon problem, it usually can be cured by increasing ventilation and or by preventing radon entry. Any person who tests mitigates or safeguards a building for radon in Pennsylvania must be certified by the Department of Environmental Protection. Uncle Joe cannot do this. Information about radon and about certified testing or mitigation firms are available through the Department of Environmental Protection. Okay. Now we've talked about this before and we're going to talk about it again. You're working with a buyer. <clears throat> They've got a cute lower level, finished nicely, and this is what you hear. Oh my God, I'm gonna put Mary Jane down here. She's 16, she's a pain in my ass, she's got the music going, I can't stand it, she's on that <laughs> laptop or on that pad, and I, 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 I can't stand it. What do you do immediately when you hear that? And what else? Thank you. I am the wife of a retired lieutenant in the fire department. I can't begin to tell you the horror stories. Mm -hmm. And you have to educate this fire. You go, wait a minute. You can't put Mary Jane in. What? It's cute as a button. I'll shut the door and I won't hear. Uh -uh. This staircase goes up into the kitchen. Yeah. Kitchen's on fire. Mary Jane's home alone. How's Mary Jane get mad at you? So you gotta say, how's she get mad at you? Now money fixes everything. With money, we can have either a walkout or with the newer construction in the last 20 years, those half sliders that have like a D well and you can climb up and make an exit. Money fixes everything. That exact scenario happened to me. She put her door in there and I said, no, you're not. She goes, what do you mean? I said, how's she getting out? And she looked at me with these huge eyes. I said, now there is a window here. A well can be added and you can make egress. And once she understood where I was coming from, she was like, oh my God, yeah, I get it. I go, yeah, I'm getting it before you move in, we're doing that. And she just looked at me, okay? So very important, they understand the risks and consequences. Radon is the other thing. If we're doing more than running down, throwing a load of wash and taking that wet wash, putting it in the dryer and folding your down there for 20 minutes, you better do radon. Long-term exposure. Sleeping. Happened to me on Broad Street. High ceilings, unfinished stone house. 
He goes, oh, Jesus Christ, I'm putting a little Johnny down here. I don't want to deal with him. He's 23. He's a mess. First thing I do is I look, and all the way to the back was an exit. Concrete steps go to the back. There, I said, okay, I said, he needs a knee brace. I said, all right, John, I'm going to go to that, but you have to do right on Think you're a pain in my dupa. I said, I don't care if I'm a pain in your dupa. And that wasn't the word he used. I said, we're going to do radon because he's down here. He's 23. He's coming in Friday night at 2 in the morning, and he's sleeping to 2 in the afternoon on Saturday. And you look at me. That's 12 hours, long-term exposure. Ugh. Guess what popped on? Mm -hmm. Guess what popped on? Now the seller mitigated it with a mitigating system, which is a pit that goes in the basement with a fan, PVC piping goes out and it goes above the roof line. It sucks, it draws up and out. Okay. Somebody's got to be in charge. I know that seems like a novel concept at some people. Here. <laughs> and their sellers and their buyers are clearly in charge. But this class is a day and day day, no more. They're not in charge. You're in charge. On-site sewage, buyer may obtain an inspection of an individual on-lot sewage disposal system, which may include a hydraulic load test from a qualified professional inspector. If and as required by the inspecting company, seller at seller's expense will locate and provide access to, empty the individual on-lot sewage disposal system and provide all water needed unless otherwise agreed. Seller, excuse me, will restore the property to its previous condition at seller's expense prior to selling. You're in the burbs again, so actually there are a few locations in the city where there is private sewer in the Northeast. And I was told there's one or two blocks in West Philly that still have private sewer, which I can't believe, but I've been told that. Where at? Roxburgh? Yeah. So if it's not public, there's no question. You have to have this checked. Let me tell you something. A bad sewer system can cost thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. Like, we're not playing here, okay? So make sure you have that inspected. Don't have that buyer going, no, Uncle Joe's going to take care of it. Mm -hmm. No, Uncle Joe's not taking care of it. Property and flood insurance. Buyer may determine the insurability of a property by making application for property and casualty insurance for the property to a reasonable insurer. I see this checked off frequently, and I don't know why, if the property is obviously in decent condition. I don't know why we're doing this. Now, it does cover for flood, and maybe that's the reason, because they don't know enough to know, and they think if a flood issue comes up. But remember, this is all on a time frame. you got 10 days to figure this out. Broker for the buyer or any, if any, otherwise broker for the seller may communicate with the insurer to assist in the insurance process. If the property is located in a specifically designated flood zone, buyer may be required to carry flood insurance at buyer's expense, which may need to be ordered 14 days or more prior to settlement. Revised flood maps and changes in federal law may subsequently increase future flood insurance premiums or require insurance for formerly exempted properties. Buyers should consult with one or more flood insurance agents regarding the need of flood insurance and possible premium increases. Many years ago, I knew a buyer ended up not qualifying. The 11th hour, the underwriter said, this the insurance was so costly, the buyer couldn't afford the property anymore. Property boundaries. Buyer may engage the service of a surveyor. Philadelphia, we do not survey. Title abstract or other qualified professionals to assist in the legal description 
certainty and locale of the boundaries and or quadrums of land. Highlight this. Most sellers have not had the property surveyed as it is not required for property transfer in Pennsylvania. And don't think that is an exemption for the city of Philadelphia because who was it? Was it Benjamin Franklin gave us the grid system? There's a ton of issues. Any fence, hedge, wall, or other natural or constructed boundary may or may not represent a true boundary line of the property. Any numerical representation of size of property or approximate only and may not be or may be inaccurate. Quick story, fish down. <sighs> Post closing, I got a phone call. <laughs> it was a matter of it. So I sold this yesterday and it's so cute. It's so interesting. And it has a backyard. And we went out there and we saw the backyard and we saw the back fence and didn't think anything of it. We went on our merry way. We could. A week later, they were having a little party. It was a lot of wine being served and some hors d'oeuvres. And the music's playing and the lights on. Because what are they doing? They're taking down the old outhouse that was on the property. Because you know how old fish town is. So I'm coming to find an outhouse in some of these things. So over the fence, they see this. <laughs> hey guys, what you doing? Oh. I just bought the house. We're so excited. Um, we're having a party because we're taking the outhouse now. Yeah, you gotta stop what you're doing. What do you mean? That's not your outhouse. It's my outhouse. I just want this. This is my house. This house. You can only imagine three lines into it what it sounded like. <laughs> Guess what? That fence was put up by God knows who on somebody else's land. So get a visual. You're here's, and I'm going to pretend it wasn't, but let's say it was Thompson Street. And all of the little road home parcels go like this. And you look at an area. Except here on Susquehanna, there was a parcel that went. all the way in on the back of these lights. Mm -hmm. That was the guy who did the things. Mm -hmm. That was an nasty lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Pay attention. Look at the lot dimensions and say to yourself, self, not look at that, right? Take your feet and walk it out. Give you a general idea. That was a nasty lawsuit. Another one happened when I first came down here in 2000, and two, no, 2000. Right on Third Street. Third, just as it's going under the bend, under the 95, where uh, Collins Boulevard. Okay, right there. Crossing. No. No. Hang on, get the visual here. Second, race, race, race as it goes under 95 to get to Columbus Boulevard. Typical little row home built in 18 somebody or something. They opened the back door in reality and the parcel ended three feet down. But it looked like it was a, and that was another ugly lawsuit. Pay attention. Okay. Uh, Lead-based paint hazards for properties built prior to 1978. Before buyer is obtaining, is obligated to purchase a residential dwelling building prior to nine, built prior to 1978. Reading is tougher. Buyer has the option to conduct a risk assessment and or inspection of the property for the presence of lead-based paint and or lead-based paint hazards. Regardless of whether this inspection is elected or waived, 
The Residential Lead Based Paint Hazard Reduction Act requires a seller of a property built prior to 1978 to provide the buyer with an EPA approved lead hazard information pamphlet titled Protect Your Family from Lead in Your Home, along with a separate form attached to this agreement, disclosing seller's knowledge of lead based paint hazards and any lead based paint records regarding the property. About 10 years ago, I'm reading the inquiry. Oh, let me get the paper. And it was a Sunday down the shore and I'm reading it and I went, oh my God. Article was about Mount Airy, I think it was. Mount Airy, beautiful homes. And a physician, just happened to be a pediatrician, bought this house. She was in love. And it dawned on her after she bought the house. I have a daughter now. Maybe I ought to have something checked. These homes have lots of windows and they're all over. Sure enough, not only did her child pop hot, but the windows popped hot. Okay. An agent, when I first came here, when it was under a different ownership, bought in the burbs. He had three children. And the house had 20 some windows. And he asked me my opinion on a couple of hiccups that were going on in the house. And I said, baby, I'm in bright looking at it. I said, oh my God, it's gorgeous. And then I said, what kind of windows are these? And he looked at me and said, they're all good. He goes, I know, I gotta replace them all. It, you know, it's just ask the question. Is enough to sometimes find out if your buyer is paying attention? What is their response? Too many people don't check, so it's an issue. I just got notified I have a home in Brigantine that apparently, who knew, <laughs> all the water coming into Brigantine is left. So now I got to do some homework. I listed a Victorian in Charsdale 10 years ago, well-maintained home. And the man was very proud of what he had. And I said, well, I was encouraging because the age of the property, let's do a home inspection first. So we could bang out some of these goofy things and get it off for when the next home inspector gets there. I said, well, what about the chimney line? Oh no, you Well, what about this? No. I took care of that. How about that? No, that's fixed. I said, what about the water line coming in? And there was a pause. <laughs> One of those pregnant pauses. He goes, it's like. I was like to myself, ha, gotcha. I said, all right, what are we doing? He goes, well, let's get it tested. So we did. I'd like. Now, because a lead pipe is forever old, because let's face it, they're going to be forever old, a couple things happen. One, have they leached all the lead that they're going to leach? There is no more lead and it's all past. Or is there a natural um, growth buildup inside the pipey that inhibits the lead to come through that? What do we call this? Fungi kind of a thing, okay? There are options. One is you dig from the house out to the middle of the street, lots of men. Or there is a filter system. And this is how I found out about it. There is a filter system that is then placed, and I believe it's before the meter. Filter system that will remove any lead and other bacteria and other elements. It's hooked up, the company comes back out and then tests the water again to make sure it's working properly. Much more cost effective and that's what we ended up doing and then disclosed it on the seller's property disclosure statement. So he was so sure of himself until I said the water line. <clears throat> So do not be afraid to challenge these people. They're just people. Okay. All right. Other. Yeah. 
So if you were uh, buying a house for an investor client, would you recommend more in this time frame to get a lot of these payments so that they can have when they run out of property since they need home? Or not necessarily? According to the EPA, we're only worried about uh, primarily peeling, chipping paint. Though the booklet does talk about water. It's it's costly. So see if anyone's interested in doing that. Other. What might we put in other? Stucco. Okay. Now, see this line of 418? Let's see how smart this classroom is. On line 418, the inspection elected above do not apply to the following existing conditions and or terms. <laughs> okay, what the heck does that line mean? Nobody knows. Challenging you, come on. What does that line mean? The inspection elected above do not apply to the following existing conditions and or items. If that aligns to exclude things that you don't want to negotiate or the seller said they don't want to negotiate, you're pretty close. Now, I have to recheck this because the booklet changed, but turn to page 42 in your booklet. Does 42... So this would be line 418 or 17. Does it have something in there? There it is. On the bottom. What does that somebody read that to me? There's a space to list any items that are to be excluded from any of these blanket inspection contingencies. The seller may want to consider excluding any items or systems that have already been disclosed as faulty. For example, if the seller has disclosed that a hot water heater needs to be replaced, that defect should be considered by the seller in setting an asking price and by the buyer when making an offer. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're a very good reader. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Including it in the list does not mean the buyer cannot inspect for it, but it does mean that the seller does not have to negotiate over it in a report as part of a written corrective proposal. The seller should consider lifting all defects so the buyer does not attempt to negotiate the offer based on an inspection report detailing a defect that was already disclosed. Thanks. Okay. Now, first off, None of you knew that, number one. Right? And if there's anybody been in the business 20 years or longer, they don't know it either. This is a wonderful tool. How about we start using it? Right? It's disclosed in the seller's property disclosure that the water heater is not working. But we're going to reiterate that point. Now, you, though, have to keep your head on your shoulders. When is that going to be filled in? Yeah. When you send over the offer or if you're an investigation and you have a blank, you need to ask the request to have to do the next color. Exactly. Which would be initialed and dated by the buyer. So you can't do it until you get it, right? That's when you're going to make that alteration. Use it. It's a fabulous tool. Okay. This next section, notice regarding property and the environmental inspections. It, it, we're talking about exterior materials such as stucco, asbestos, environmental hazards, wetland, mold, fungi. Review that yourself. All right, here we go. Inspection contingency. Math. Put your math brain on. The contingency period is blank days, 10 and not specified. And that's what we're going to go with. From the execution date of the agreement. Let's pretend. Let's pretend we wrote the offer on August the 28th. How many days are in August? 31. 31? Okay. So 
August the 28th, we wrote the offer. It was signed off on August the 31st. What day is the last day that the buyer can submit a reply to home inspection? And how did we come up with that? So you count the day after. So execution is 31, we don't count that. So now we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I'm not kidding. Use your finger. Okay? Yeah. I don't care how you identify your dates. Do you take a regular calendar and you write on it? Execution date. And then you count ten. Last day for inspection. And you mark it. While you're in there, you're going to mark seven days before closing. So you got to find out where the closing is. 60 days, and you're going to close on the 20th. And now you have to back up seven or 10, however, it was determined when your uh, mortgage contingency is due. Get all that busy work done. Either you put it on a tickler, you put it on something that's computerized, you put it on your phone, you put it, I don't care how you do it, just freaking do it. Put it on somewhere so you can keep tabs of what these dates are. Because what happens when we don't? Me a date. Well, do you want to be that age you know as the default agent? No, I don't think so. Okay. So for each inspection elected in paragraph 12C within the stated contingency period, and as a result of any inspections elected in 12C, except as stated in paragraph 13C, craziness. If the results of the inspection elected in 12C are satisfactory to the buyer, buyer's like, hey, I can deal with this. Buyer will present all reports. You better do that. Because on the sell side is Mr. Returning, who said, that buyer and buyer's agent are in default because they did not include all the reports. Yeah. That was another issue. In their entirety to the seller, of which they will accept the property with the information stated in the reports and agree to release in paragraph 28 of the agreement. Or... If the results of the inspection elected in 12C are unsatisfactory to the buyer, buyer will present all reports in their entirety to the seller and terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller with all deposit monies returning to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26 of this agreement. You represent the buyer. And you call up the listing agent and say, listen, I'm going to send over the reports. And the listing agent says, don't you dare. What is your reaction? Now, because <laughs> I'm that kind of person. I used to say the reports and then the reply less. So they had opened it first before they got to what I was doing. All right, we turn the page. And then the next page says, if the results of any inspections elected in paragraph 12 say, are unsatisfactory to the buyer. The buyer will present all reports in their entirety to the seller with a written corrective proposal listing corrections and or credits desired by the buyer. The proposal may, but not required to, include the name of the properly licensed and qualified professionals to perform the corrected corrections requested in the proposal, which is often nice. Because now you know who's doing it. Providing for payments. Ah, so who's paying for it? I want the seller to pay for it. So you're going to identify that. You're going to use my guy, who's licensed and insured, but you're going to pay. Including retesting 
and any projected date of completion of the corrections. Buyer agrees that seller will not be held liable for corrections that do not comply with the mortgage lender or government requirements if performed in a workmanlike manner. Mm. Those two words are about as loosey goosey as it gets. Who determines what's a workmanlike matter? No one. According to the terms of the buyer's proposal. All right, here we go. Pay attention. Following the end of the contingency period, underline that, highlight that. When is it? If we're working on a 10, 5, and 2, on the 10th day, following the end of the contingency period, Buyer and seller will have five days if not specified for the negotiation period during the negotiating period. Now, here we go. That's too easy. Our execution date is the first. 31st. Our execution is the 31st. So we count 10 days. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we know on the tenth day we have to submit our wish list. That's really what it is. It's a wish list to the seller. We're very proactive people, and we had our home inspection done on day two. I got the results on day three, and we're in a rush. So we're going to turn it in. So we turned it in on one, two, three, on the third day. But we have to go to the tenth day. When does the seller have to respond? Fifteen. Exactly correct. Is there any good goddamn reason why we should be sending this in so early? No. Let me tell you, because you have a license doesn't mean you know what you're doing. And that runs rampant in our industry along with others. So if you are one of these agents who are very tenacious, tenacious, and once you have your executed agreement, you send that kind of thank you email to the listing agent. They're very I want to thank you for allowing us to be in just the way you execution date was August 31st. Response from the buyer will be on the 10th of September. Response from the seller will be on the 15th. Response from the buyer will be on the 2nd. If you want to spell out these things, that's nice. Everybody then is on the same page. Many, many agents do not omit the execution date. They add that date. Okay, so everybody signed on the 31st. So instead of going to the first, they go 31, 32, 30, yeah, and they go like this 31, 1, 2, 3, 4. And now we got the wrong fingers going. I can't tell you how many times I get phone calls for this. So let's try to get our numbers right. Now, with that said, um, Seller will acknowledge in writing seller agrees to satisfy all the terms of buyer's proposal or, so let's keep in mind, sellers have four choices when this happens. Choices are one through four. One, oh my God, I didn't even know seller says A, B, and C were broken. I'll take care of it, don't worry. I'll fix it. Or he says, listen, I'm not fixing A and B, but I'll fix C. Or he says, I'm not fixing any. <laughs> or his fourth choice may be, listen, I'm not fixing good as well. I'm a reasonable person. I will credit your buyer X amount of dollars, and then they can run into the big. Okay, they're the four choices a seller has, so we can identify that. So if seller agrees, so he agrees on the first one, he's going to take care of it. Two, line 461. Buyer and seller will negotiate another mutual acceptable written agreement, providing for any repairs or improvements to the property and or any credits to the buyer at settlement. 
as acceptable to a mortgage lender. What does that mean? As acceptable to a mortgage lender. So it is counted as a seller's assessed. Okay. So the loan institution, if a financial remedy is determined, the loan officer needs to know about that because that is considered seller's assist. Now, what if they're already getting seller's assist? And let's go right to the throat. It's maxed out on an FHA at 6%. Now, what are we doing? Credit to the to construction, the contractor. Credited to a contractor. So do you mean on the sheet, it would show a payment to a contractor for services rendered? Okay, that's an option. But you better have a hotline to your mortgage bank. Not all institutions, loan institutions, will be comfortable with that. So sometimes you guys have to finagle. What's another little, oh, so you've got a smart selling agent. I mean, listing agent. She's brilliant. She goes, oh, please. Just have them pay the transfer checks. Can we do that? Can we just have the buyer pay the transfer checks? Depends the lender. That would be considered, it would, yes. And or in reverse. All right, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll get our seller to pay the buyer's transfer tax. Oh, seller's assist again. Can you just change the listing price? Oh, no. I don't want Edna across the street to know I got a penny less than I told her. <laughs> oh, please. Absolutely. Here's another one. There's other little ways. When it's not a lot of money, maybe like under two grand. I've done it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> where I've had the seller pay for the one year advance homeowners for the buyers. Now, how do we do that? Well, they decided they wanted all state and they got an HO3, which is a better policy than an HO2, HO being homeowners. An HO2 is the minimal coverage needed for a mortgage, but an HO3 with a very small increase in monthly cost covers a lot more. Just throwing that out. So we get an invoice from Allstate that says it's going to be $1,800 for this coverage. The seller takes that, walks over to the insurance guy, and pays for it. Now, all we see on the Alta or the HUD is a POC, paid outside of closing. And everybody's got a paid statement. We don't know who paid for it, it's just me. Oh, that's a little late. Okay. Oh, if no mutual acceptable written agreement is reached, or if the seller fails to respond, very important. Somehow the seller went under rent, fails to respond during the negotiating period within two days if not specified, following the end of the negotiating period. Buyer will accept the property with the information stated in the report and agree to release in paragraph 28 or terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller with all deposit money to return to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26. Now, these next, this next paragraph, you better put 13 stars next to it. Mm -hmm. If buyer and seller do not reach a mutually acceptable written agreement, and buyer does not terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller within the time allotted in 13B3B. Buyer will accept the property and agree to release in paragraph 28 of this agreement. Ongoing negotiations do not, do not automatically extend the negotiating period. So if seller goes underground, buyer has to make a decision. Am I staying in here? Because if all of a sudden he appears on the 18th day, you've now bought this house hook, line, and sinker with all the bumps and bruises. 
Or do you terminate to cover your dupa and then he reappears? Okay. Terminate. We'll have it ready to go. She wants to scare them. Like, I don't play with you. So I'm at. And they go, wait a minute, you're real. I just had someone today say, oh, tell her came back and turned it in. And they said, wait a minute, you're for real. I was just kidding. I just thought I'd try. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. If the report reveals, yeah, baby. So say Kevin's doing a gifting period, right? You said we're gonna buy a supply by the end, sell the book raise to it, and the entertainment terms is signed. Does that change the rest of this or can your buyer still change their mind on day 16 or 17? Now, once the mutual acceptable written agreement has been executed, parties over. Okay. If the report reveals the need to expand or replace existing, oh, this talks about sewage. We're not going to deal with it. Just saying, it's like everything else. You got so many days to do it. You have to have an expert come in, blah, blah, blah. Title, survey, and costs within blank days, seven. A lot of people miss this. Seven days, you got to order title. If not specified from the execution date of the agreement, Buyer will order from a reputable title company for delivery to the seller a, is that comprehensive? Con comprehensive title report on the property. Upon receipt, buyer will deliver a free copy of the title report to the seller. Buyer is encouraged to obtain an owner's title policy to protect the buyer. An owner's title policy is different from a lender's title policy, which will not protect the buyer from claims and attacks on title. This is where your title company gets involved. They do that on a regular basis, but then there's somebody who was up at 2.30 in the morning and saw an infomercial. And they're like, no, 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 I just need, I don't need that. Yeah, 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 you do. Owner's title insurance policies come in standard and enhanced versions. Buyers should consult with a title insurance agent about the buyer's options. Buyer agrees to release and discharge any and all claims and losses against the broker. For buyers, should buyer neglect to obtain owner title insurance policy. Buyer will pay the following. Title search, title insurance, and or mechanic lien insurance. What is mechanic lien insurance? Isn't that when the GC puts a lien against you and you didn't pay them for a vendor? Mm -hmm. So a mechanic is a vendor who has put a lien against your property. Often this is found, but not isolated to new construction. There was a development like seven, eight years ago in Jersey. Woo! The entire development, everybody had to lean against them. <laughs> Every house from one of the vendors, electric, plumbing, insulation, whoever, and he whoo, hit them all. It was a hot mess. And any fee for cancellation, flood insurance, fire insurance, hazardous insurance, mine insurance, or any fee for cancellation, appraisal fee and charges paid in advance to a mortgage lender, buyer's customary settlement costs and accrues, any survey or survey required by a title insurance company or the abstract company to prepare an adequate legal description of the property or the corrections thereof will be obtained and paid for by the seller. So if the buyer does have a survey done, elects to do it, though it's not mandated because something looks screwy. Got that phone call. Vic, I'm at the home inspection. And I got to tell you, the fence between the two properties is screwy at best. It goes around the old oak tree and then heads down on a 45 degree angle. What should I do? I said, you need to pay for a survey. And guess what? It was all wrong. 
that fence was on the wrong side of the line, it was really bad. So when your stomach does that funny flip and something just doesn't look right, you're fine. it's not right. The correction then has to be done by the seller. Any survey or surveys desired by the buyer or required by a mortgage lender will be obtained and paid for by the buyer. The property will be conveyed with good and marketable title that is insurable by a reputable title insurance company at the regular rates, free and clear of all liens, encumbrances, and easements, except, however, the following existing deed restrictions, historical preservational restrictions, or ordinances, building restrictions, ordinance, easements of road, easements visible upon the ground, easements of record and private privileges or rights of public service company. Has anyone ever taken two minutes and read the title report that you have gotten from your title company? The novel concept you ought to consider. <laughs> oh, mommy. Okay. And you want to identify it, and you will often see in properties easement noted from AT&T. <laughs> Used to say that, you know. It could be from the phone company. It could be from the electric company. It could be from a, a big gas line that runs through in the burbs, well, as in the city, you better be checking what's under your parcel before you dig that $75,000 rain ground pool. Right. If any changes in the seller's financial status affects the seller's ability to convey title to the property on or before settlement or any extension thereof, the seller shall properly notify the buyer in writing a change in financial status includes, but not limited to, seller filing bankruptcy, filing for a foreclosure lawsuit against the property, enter of a monetary adjustment against the seller noted for public tax sale affecting the property, and seller learning that the sales price of the property is no longer sufficient to satisfy all the liens and encumbrances against the profits. That last sentence, what kind of action are we speaking of? They don't have enough money to cover all their debts. What is that? Short sale, okay? If you have a buyer who's interested in a property that clearly indicates in the MLS, this property is a short sale. What closing date are you putting in there? <laughs> 30 days is not the right answer. You can hopefully do 60, but more like 90 plus. So let's not get false hope to this buyer. Okay, You're going to have to make arrangements if you're getting out of your apartment, because this isn't closing in 60 days. Okay. If seller is unable to give good and marketable title that is insurable by a reputable title company at the regular rates as specified in 14E, buyer may terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller and all deposit monies are returned to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26 of this agreement or take such title as seller can convey. If the title condition precludes seller from conveying title, Buyer's sole remedy shall be to terminate this agreement. Upon termination, all deposits and monies will be returned to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26 of this agreement. And seller will reimburse buyer for the cost accrued by buyer for any inspections, certifications obtained according to the terms of the agreement. And for those items specified in 14C, items 1, 2, and 3, and 4. Paragraph 14 day. Oil, gas, mineral, and other rights of the property may have been previously conveyed or leased, 
and a seller makes no representation about the status of those rights unless indicated elsewhere in the agreement, such as we checked off the box for oil, gas, and mineral, mineral right addendums. Where might you find that that form has been checked off? Country? Poconos. Poconos, we're doing all kinds of, what the heck is that word? Fracking. That's the word, fracking. People made a lot of money on fracking, <clears throat> which are mineral rights, oil, and gas. And it goes on to tell you all about that. Let's go look where it says private transfer fee addendum is attached to be made part of this agreement. In Pennsylvania, private transfer fees are identified and regulated in the private transfer fee obligation, which defines a private transfer fee as a fee that is payable upon the transfer of the interest of real property or payable for the right to make or accept the transfer. If the obligation is paid the fee or change runs with title to the property or otherwise binds subsequent owners of the property. May I pick on you? Yes. Since you're a lovely reader. Sure. And read K for me, which would be paragraph 14K in the Bible, what it says. Paragraph K. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, private transfer fees. Yes. Some property in Pennsylvania may be subject to private transfer fees, which are defined in subparagraph J2. The default language is that the property is not subject to a private transfer fee. If you know that the transfer of the property will require a fee, fill in the blank provided. Okay, there you go. I guess that answers it. Is, is there something for K? Okay. Okay. That was good. Okay, there we go. Um, and then, of course, I is coal notice. No coal here, but coal up in the Poconos. Notice assessments and municipal requirements. In the event, any notice of public and or private assessments as described in paragraph 10F, excluding <clears throat> assess value, are received after the seller has signed the agreement and before settlement. Seller will, within five days of receiving the notice and or assessment, provide a copy of the notice and or assessment to the buyer. This has been an issue when the seller hasn't done this. A big transaction just fell apart with us because the seller, one was in Europe, one was in South America, and nobody noticed that this can. And will notify buyer in writing that the seller will fully comply with the notice and or assessment at, at seller's expense before settlement. If seller fully complies with the notice and or assessments, Buyer accepts the property and agrees to release in paragraph 28 of the agreement, or seller not complying with the notice and or assessment. If seller chooses not to comply with the notice and or assessment or fails within the stated time to notify the buyer, because that's what happened to us, whether seller will comply, buyer will notify the seller in writing within five days that the buyer will comply with the notice and assessments at buyer's expense, accept the property and agree to release a paragraph 28 of the agreement or terminate this agreement by written notice to the seller with all deposit monies returning to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26 of this agreement. If buyer fails to respond within the time stated in 15A2, or fails to terminate this agreement and written notice to the seller within that time, 
What happened? Oh, yeah. But it will accept the property with all of those dangling points of it. And agree to release in paragraph 28 of the agreement. If required by law, within 30 days of execution date of this agreement, but in no case later than 15 days prior to settlement, seller will order seller's expense, at seller's expense, the certification from the appropriate municipal departments disclosing notice of any uncorrected violations of zoning, housing, building, safety, or fire ordinances and or a certification permitting occupancy of the property. If buyer receives a notice of any required repairs or improvements, buyer will promptly deliver a copy of the notice to the seller. What are we talking about that last paragraph? You and a or CO certification of occupancy, which you'll find on new construction. Make sure you have that done. If you have a service such as, let's pretend, take me to clothing, they will make sure that this is ordered within the time frame indicated. If not, and you're doing it on your own, that's another one of those dates. Back up 15 days, boop, got to order it. Okay, now, on this assessment part, this also has to deal with condominiums. There are condos and they vary so differently on the homeowners on how they run it. So let's say three years ago, there was a special assessment for new windows. But in that agreement with the association, it states that if this current owner sells this property, they have to pay all of the assessment before it goes to closing. Ooh. If you're dealing with a condominium, Ask the nasty questions. Mr. Seller, are there any special assessments? And he, he hesitated and blinked. What is your job to get to the truth? Because we don't trust anybody. So he blinked and hesitated when I asked that question. What's your job now? There you go. How about you go right to the horse? Yo, Vicki Carey from Keller Williams. I'm listing one, two, three on the fifth floor. Okay. Any special assessments you guys got going right now? Yeah, we passed it three years ago. It's $18,000. You need a new air conditioning. And how does that happen if he sells? What is the terms that they've agreed to as owners in the association? Don't rely on these people. They lie to you. Within five days of receiving notice from the municipalities that repairs or improvements are required, seller will deliver a copy of the notice to the buyer and notify the buyer in writing that the seller will make the required repairs or improvements to satisfy the municipality. If seller makes the repairs and improvements, buyer accepts the property or not make the repairs, required repairs and improvements. If seller chooses not to make the required repairs or improvements, buyer notifies the seller in writing within five days that the buyer will accept a temporary access certification. Not all municipalities offer that. So you've got to find out if that's even viable. To be used as a use and occupancy certification, Agree to release in paragraph 28 of the agreement and make the repairs at buyer's expense after settlement or terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller with all deposit monies returning to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26. If buyer fails to respond within the time stated in 15B1 or fails to terminate this agreement, notice to the seller within that time. What happens? Buyer will accept and agrees to release. Can't have your buyer go under it. When all else fails, is your buyer's a nitpick, get them to terminate. We can always come back. Get them the hell out before something else happens because they don't have the sense guy gave them boost to know that you're buying this with everything. Are you grasping what I'm telling? 
and you're like, they're not in there. I don't know what to do. They're not in there. I'll tell you what. Let's do this. Let's just terminate right now. Let's just terminate. Take a step back. <sighs> Take a deep breath and a day to figure this out. You can always get back in. But all these consequences happen, right? Okay. Due diligence. You can do the your inspection, and you decide to come back. You can do the inspection, and you come back, and you can start over. I would recommend, depending on the time frame, I would recommend writing a new agreement. And then clearly we're not inspecting anything, right? So we're going to waive all that because we're already doing it. Right. Yeah. And that's why, here's a good example from the first question I asked on the first day. What is the date of the agreement of sale? Because if you're writing a new one, it's not going to be August 1st, is it? It's going to be October, whatever the day is. Okay. We're going to talk, uh, let me just say one thing. Look on line 584. If repairs and improvements are required and seller fails to provide a copy of the notice to buyer as required in this section, seller will perform all repairs and improvements as required by the notice at seller's expense. Okay. Condominiums. This is another one. Time frames are important. This contract is based off the mindset that the property we're writing is not a condominium or planned community. Property is not a condominium or part of a planned community unless checked below. So is it a condo or is it a planned community? You got to find that out, right? Now, condominium. The property is a unit of a condominium that is primarily run by unit owners. Association known as, underline this, because when I say these numbers, people gaze at me longingly, as a 3407, that's what Condominium Act is, the 3407 of the Uniform Condominium Act of Pennsylvania requiring sellers to furnish buyers with certificates of resale and copies of condominium declarations other than plots and plans, the bylaws, the rules and regulations of the association. Or is it a planned community known as a homeowners association? The property is part of a planned community as identified by the Uniform Plan Planned Community Act known as 5407 of the act requiring the seller to furnish buyer with a copy of the declarations other than plots and plans, the bylaws and the rules and regulations of the association and a certificate containing provision set forth in paragraph 540A of the Act. The following applies to initial sales of the property that are part of a condominium or a planned community. Now, this is really important. Every developer in the city of Philadelphia has gone <laughs> this paragraph. And this paragraph states, if this is the first sale of the property after creation, after it was built, of the condominium or planned community, therefore the sale by the deck by the declaration, seller shall furnish the buyer with what? The public offering statement. And when? Oh yeah. No later than the date buyer executes the agreement. Well, I haven't seen that done in 25 years. What is a public offering? <laughs> the public offering statement is of this. I'm the developer and I'm building a 30 unit condiment. So as they're being sold off, we have to have rules, right? Because right now we're kind of running rampant, like everybody forgot about rules in this world. And that is to control the masses. We have to have rules, right? So since we don't have an association yet, because I generally saw two of the 30 
we have to have rules. The public offering statement is that it's a very boiler plated type of guidelines on how the condominium is to be run. I am the president because I'm the developer. So I have very basic guidelines on how we're going to run this until 50% of the development is sold out. Once 50% is sold out, the developer, Vicki, will then hand it over to the 50% of the people who have ownership, who will then create a condo association that can make alterations and changes. It's very much boilerplate. Yeah. This is supposed mm -hmm. to be given to the buyer when? Oh, yeah, that's right. When they execute the agreement. I've seen it handed to the buyers at closing. <laughs> this is horse hot. Many years ago, when I was with Prudential, I had an agent who still is in the industry today who wrote an offer on a two unit condo. Big house, cut it in half, made two condos. So that's 50% of all, right? So she wrote the offer and she said, Nick. They told me they don't have the um, public offering statement ready yet. Okay. Because they're just so busy. And so, yeah, I got so many more things to do. They need to worry about this. Yeah. This, yeah. I was going to ask you because you did that mechanics name on those 40 houses. You're talking about your neighbors. Was that a public offering type of property or was it an association? No. Yeah. Each individual that vendor sued every single, put a lien on every property. Oh, I don't remember the details, but it was one of the vendors who did it. It wasn't getting it paid. Like it was all, it had a it yeah, no. Well, they, um, okay, so <clears throat> I said, okay, let's do this. That's when we used to put a check with the offer. And then 10 days later, we put a second deposit. So on the last page, we wrote that the second deposit will be given to the seller five days after we receive the public offering statement. Well, this developer is so excited to see somebody who really wants to sell me so happy. And I can't wait. Where do I sign? Give me that. Sign. Did he read it? Got him. You know, we didn't get the public offering statement until we got to the table. And they also never got their second deposit either. Every week, that listing agent called. You have it? You have it? She goes, I don't know. Do I have it? I don't have my public offering statement. Every week. <laughs> See, when you get an offer, you have to read. Because maybe, just maybe, that buyer agent's a little smarter than you. All right. This is a problem. But nobody addresses it, and I don't know how to say, I don't, I don't know what to say, because we're on the downslope of this chaotic three years of put an offer in and you're one of 50. That's on the downslope. <laughs> so at some point when the market makes a complete change and every seller is just begging for you to buy my house, they'll be a little bit more attentive to their jobs. But can you be firm and stiff and say, I'm not putting that offer in, damn it, until I get this? Your buyer's going to be frustrated with you. So it, it, it's a caveat. It really is. When you get a public offering statement or the, the uh, rules and regulations of the homeowner's position, can you then read them and walk away if it's in my book for And we'll speak about that shortly. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. All right. So. On line 605, within, all right. So here's the question I'm going to ask you. Within 15 days of the execution date of the agreement, seller at seller's expense will request from the association a certification of resale and any other documentation necessary to enable the seller to comply with the relative act. So the act is either the 5407 or the 3407. The act provides that the association is required to provide these documents within 10 days. So 
what is the time frame that it could max out before a buyer sees documentation of the 34 or 54 or so? 25 weeks. So you have a 30 day closing. I know factually that buyers have sat at the table at closing and reviewed their 34 or 54 or so. So keep that in mind because there is a 25 day window. Seller will promptly deliver to buyer all documents received from the association. Under the act, seller is not liable to buy women. Seller is not liable to buyer for the failure of the association to provide the certificates in a timely manner or for any incorrect information provided by the association. Associations are sloppy as hell. You have got to be on them. The act provides, now here's the other thing. And when I first got here with the other ownership, this actually happened. And it was an in-house transaction. And the buyer was due their 3407. 3407 used to come in a book like this. And the listing agent had to get the book, take the book to the buyer agent, and get them to sign off on a document, which we will talk about. Now it's done on CDs or emails. Well, guess what? They only sent half of it. They didn't send all of the 3407. Buyer got cold feet and was waiting and said, you know what? I changed my mind. We sent over the termination. They went, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no. See this email? We sent over the paper. Mm, but you didn't send all of it. And that's how we got out. <laughs> so keep tabs on your dates. Those things are usually not free. Either. No, the seller has to pay. The seller pays on mm -hmm. the average somewhere in the neighborhood of five hundred dollars these days. Yeah, so make sure your seller's aware. Yeah, great, good point. And I've had um, different condo issues. Like my sellers reached out to the condo board, and then called me up and said, "What exact, what exact forms do you need?" And I'm like, "They know exactly what we need." Yes, I literally had to break down the exact documents that we're looking for, and then my seller will get back to whoever's in charge of the condo board. And I still had to negotiate that and tell them what we need. And that's their job. They know they need to provide it. They're probably going to it and be all out of date because we had a condo fall through. And then my seller needed to order it again. And she was like, well, can't we just use what we ordered? It was only 40 days ago. But by law, we had to, it has to be within the 30 days. Yep. <laughs> so she reordered, paid all the money again. It came in. Everything had the exact same delay. All the document, and I was like, I'm sorry, that's just the way it is because we need to show because of addendums. That's why the this Commonwealth made that decision 30 days to catch an addendum. Mm -hmm. Was the reason was there those things are updated to show you that people in the condo the oh, they have lawsuits and they have the condo fees. So, yes, a lot of things are constantly updated. Yes, correct, absolutely. Seller will promptly deliver. To buyer, all documents received from the association under the act. This, oh, I read that. I'm sorry. The act provides that the buyer may declare this agreement void. Okay. When can the buyer get out? At any time before the buyer receives the association documentation and for five days after receipt. So the buyer has five days to review this or until settlement, whichever occurs first. Buyer notice to the seller must be in writing upon buyer declaring this agreement void. All deposit monies will be returned to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26 of the agreement. If the association has the right to buy the property, known as a right of first refusal, and the association exercises that right, Seller will reimburse the buyer for any costs accrued by the buyer for any inspections or certifications obtained according to the terms of the agreement, any costs accrued for the buyer for title, insurance, search, or mechanic lien insurance, or for any fees of cancellation of flood, fire, hazard, mine insurance, or any fees for cancellation of appraisal and charges paid in advance to the mortgage lender. So you say to me, Zach, I don't understand. What do you mean the first right of refusal? Okay. 
This is a condominium that may have both commercial and residential zoning. On the first floor, 25 years ago, that developer rented, uh, sold it to someone technically that kind of lived in there, but it was actually zoned commercial. And thought whenever they leave, then the new owner or me, if I still own it, can put a little bodega in there. Well, that son of a gun just never moved. <laughs> and his niece, cute little thing, you know, the one on Thanksgiving, uh, that niece got a real estate license. And Uncle Joe said, okay, baby, I'm going to sell. I, I want out of this first floor unit. I'm tired of it. All the crazies go by, they leave trash, they get in my bush, you know, I, I don't know. Okay, so she's going to list Uncle Joe's condo. It just so happens that her girlfriend, who just graduated, had a rich aunt who gave her a bunch of money to buy her first house. So maybe it made the MLS. Maybe it didn't make the MLS. It happened so quickly, you know? Okay. Well, this whole time, the association never knew it was for sale and other country. But never did anybody remember from 25 years ago that that unit had the first rate of refusal. Oh, so a truck pulls up with a lot of ladders and stuff. And the president of the association happens to walk around the corner and it's like looking at this guy and says, what you doing? He goes, oh, I'm inspecting unit 100 on the first floor. That just sold. <laughs> Our chance, first time in 25 years to grab this place. Now that seller gets notified. Hey, 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 wait a minute. You didn't tell me you were selling. We have the first right to buy this if this ever goes on sale, and we're going to execute it. Now that little girl who's paying for the home inspection and paid for radon because it was on the first floor, and whatever is out, that contract becomes null and void. Check when you're doing listing condominiums if that is a contingency of a first rate of refusal on any of those units. Yes. When you first start the thing in the beginning, and you find out who actually owns the property, that be even as far as who has. Well, you would only know that from the association because it's the association who has the rights. So they wait till all the way back in the good thing for this agreement to find out about the contracts for the condo and first right of refusal within 15 days of execution. Okay, the seller orders the association has 10 days to fulfill the order, doesn't always fall in 25 days. They're hot messes, most of the associations, and it may take another 20 days, of which you're way into the project. Now, if you wanted to be proactive and have the seller pull all the documents ahead of time, so be it and pay the 500, knowing it's only good for 30 days, and then we're going to have to redo it again. Yeah. Same in Delaware, New Jersey, again. Same in the um, don't know for sure, so I can't obligate myself. I'd have to review that. It may be, but in Pensy, that's how it is. Okay. Now, that talks about the first rate of refusal, and guess what? Now, this poor buyer has got to get paid back from the seller. All those cost factors. Real estate tax and assessed value. In Pennsylvania, taxing authorities, school districts, and municipalities, and property owners may appeal the assessed value of a property, excuse me, at any time of sale or at any time thereafter. A successful appeal by a tax authority may result in higher assessed values of the property and an increase in property taxes. Also, Periodic countywide property reassessments may change the assessed value of the property and result in change of property taxes. Maintenance and risk. Seller will maintain the property included but not limited to structure, ground, fixtures, appliance, and personal properties specifically listed in this agreement in its present condition, normal wear and tear acceptance. 
If any part of the property included in the sale fails before settlement, seller will A, repair or replace the part of the property before settlement, or provide prompt written notice to the buyer of seller's decision to credit the buyer of the fair market value of the failed part of the property. That is very difficult. You're at the settlement table and you did the walkthrough and the, re the washing machine's not working. And it wasn't one of these where is as is appliances written in the contract. So that is expected to be working. So now how do we determine a 10 year old whirlpool? What is the value of that? What are you gonna do other than call measure? <laughs> Let's think, who would know the value of a 10 year old whirlpool? How about a used appliance company? Yeah, how about that? To get some range from X to Y, right? Not repair or replace the failed part of the property and not credit the buyer at settlement for the fair market value of the failed part of the property. Excuse me. If seller does not repair or replace the failed part of the property or agree to credit the buyer for the fair market value or if, fail, or if the seller fails not to notify the buyer of seller's choices, buyer will notify the seller in writing within five days or before settlement date, whichever is earlier, that the buyer will... <laughs> Accept the property and agree to release in paragraph 28 or terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller with all deposit monies returning to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26. If buyer fails to respond within the stated time in paragraph 18b3 or fails to terminate this agreement by written notice, Seller bears the risk of loss from fire and other casualties. Until, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a line. Agreement by written notice to the seller within that time, buyer will accept the property and agree to release in paragraph 28 of the agreement. Seller bears the risk of loss of fire and other casualties until settlement. That happened. Get a call. Hey, I just drove by the new house. Yeah. He goes, we closed in four days. Yeah. He goes, there was a fire. I said, what? He goes, I can see the garage door is all melted. I said, all right. Hang on. So I called the listing agent, who was a very good agent, still was a good agent. And I said, my buyer just went by. What the hell happened? <laughs> she goes, yeah, it's going to call you today. Then. Okay, well, well, it was the fall <clears throat> and the leaves all kind of gathered there in the corner and somebody driving them by went with a cigarette. Lit the leaves up, which lit the side of the garage up. Okay, all right. They put the claim in. We're waiting for the adjuster to come out. Okay, all right. We can fix this, right? Okay. So now let's decide what we're going to do. Oh, okay. So now we know that stuff went bad. If any property included in the sale is destroyed or not replaced prior to settlement, the buyer will, oh, I got to interrupt real fast. Remember I talked about the 3407 and the 5407? Guess what? We have co-ops in the city of Philadelphia. What are those papers called? Uh, they're called 4409s. <laughs> Take a notation. If you sell a co-op, you're looking for a 4409. Sorry. The buyer will either accept the property in its current condition together with the proceeds of any insurance recovered obtained by the seller or terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller with all deposit monies returning to the buyer according to paragraph 28. Okay. Home warranties. At or before settlement. Now this can be done right at the table. Either party can purchase a home warranty for the property from a third party vendor. Buyer and seller understand that a home warranty for the property 
does not alter any disclosure requirements for the seller. What does that little part of that sentence mean? That means you have a seller who says, listen, I'm going to take out a home warranty. The shit's a little sweet. <laughs> that doesn't mean he stops disclosing that his things are sweet, right? <clears throat> The property does not alter any disclosure requirements of the seller, will not cover or warrant any pre-existing defects to the property, and will not alter, waive, or extend any provisions of this agreement regarding inspections or certifications, bless you, that buyer has elected to waive or as part of the agreement. Buyer and seller understands that a broker who recommends a home warranty may have a business relationship with the home warranty company that provides a financial benefit to the broker. Recording. This agreement will not be recorded in the Office of Recorder of Deeds. Everybody goes, what do you mean this isn't recorded? The agreement, not the deed. This agreement will not be recorded. Or in any other office or place of public record. If buyer causes or permits this agreement or permits this agreement to be recorded, seller may elect to treat such act as a defect. Default. Thank you. Default of this agreement. Assignment. This agreement is binding upon the parties, their heirs, personal representative, guardians, and assessors. And to the extent assignable on the assigns of the parties here too. Buyer will not transfer or assign this agreement without written consent of the seller unless otherwise stated in this agreement. Assignment of this agreement may result in additional transfer tax. Something I want you to keep in mind. If you <clears throat> are dealing with an attorney on a list side, you send over the contract, the agreement of sale, you have a buyer who wants to buy it. And you send it over. Do not be surprised if the attorney crosses out this. Why? He doesn't want the parties, their heirs, personal representatives to be part of this. So don't be surprised if they cross that out. Be careful with assignments. Because the seller has to be made aware that buyer A is coming in to buy it, to sell it to buyer B, who's going to make a profit. And that's how this works. It's not illegal. It is legal. But the seller has to be made aware. Governing laws, venues, and personal jurisdictions. The validity and construction of this agreement and the rights and duties of the parties will be governed in accordance with the laws of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The parties agree that any dispute, controversy, or claims arising under or in connection with this agreement or its performance by either party submitted to the court shall be filed exclusively by and in the state or federal court settings of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Foreign investments, may I tap into you? Paragraph 23, please. The buyer. Please. Uh, yes. Foreign investment in real estate property tax act of 1980. Bertha. Bertha permits the IRS to impose a tax on foreign persons upon disposition of real estate located in the United States. For purposes of the act, a foreign person can be a non resident alien individual, a foreign corporation foreign partnership, foreign trust, or foreign estate. This term does not apply to resident aliens. If FERTA applies to your transaction, the transferee, the buyer, must deduct and withhold the proper amount of tax due to the IRS on the sale. If they fail to properly withhold, the buyer may be liable for the tax. It is strongly suggested that the buyer seek legal and or tax advice prior to signing the agreement if the property is owned by a foreign person. Okay, <clears throat> this doesn't happen too often, but it does happen. So just be made aware 
that if they are a foreign entity, that additional taxes will be owed. Check with the title company immediately because they are much more schooled on this, okay? Um, trying to buzz along here. Notice regarding convicted sex offenders, buyers are encouraged to contact the Municipal Police Department of the Pennsylvania Real Estate Police. You have a buyer who comes to you, put an offer in, it was accepted, two days later said, I just found out from my coworker that there is a sex offender up the street. It is the due diligence of the buyer to determine if the area they are living in is considered safe. And you'd be surprised if you pull this up, Megan's Law, and you do some homework, Little did you know that Mr. Jones, who's lived there 15 years around the corner as a sex offender, you never knew. So it varies from all different circumstances, which have nothing to do with you and I, but that buyer needs to know it is their responsibility to do the due diligence in regards to Megan's Law. Representation. All representation, claims, advertising, promotional activities, brochures, or plans of any kind made by the seller, broker, their licensees, employees, officers, or partners are not a part of the agreement unless expressly incorporated or stated in the agreement. This agreement contains the whole agreement between the seller and the buyer. And there are no terms, obligations, covenants, representations, statements or conditions, oral or otherwise, of any kind whatsoever concerning this sale. This agreement will not be altered, amended, changed, or modified, except with written consent of all parties, unless otherwise stated in this agreement. Buyer has accepted the property. Let's go back a couple of years when buyers were buying property without inspections. I had a conversation, COVID was here and things were crazy with an agent who's been in the business almost 50 years. And she was from another brokerage. Actually, she was the manager. And she got on the phone with me about something, about having a disclaimer that they are, uh, the buyer is purchasing this property without an inspection, a reiteration. And I said, you ought to know, perhaps in there, paragraph 25 did. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, well, let's read it. Buyer has inspected the property. It's a factual statement. If that buyer has chosen not to, that should be exempted. That it, or main indicator, re-indicating buyer. You are, in here, it says you're inspecting it. If you choose not to inspect it, then we need to reiterate that you've made that choice. Well, what would you do then? Would you initiate it here or, or give an addendum? I, I would do it on the last page of the agreement. <clears throat> so buyer has inspected the property. They never even walked in it, let alone inspected it, including fixtures and personal property specifically listed herein before signing this agreement or has waived the right to do so and agrees to purchase the property in its present as-is condition. All properties are sold in as-is condition unless otherwise identified. Subject to inspection contingencies elected in the agreement, buyer acknowledges that the broker, their licensees, employees, officers, or partners have not made an independent examination or determined the structural soundness of the property. You are not an architect, engineer, home inspector. No, that's not your job. But the age or conditions of the components, environmental conditions, the permit use or the conditions existing in local locales where the property is situated, nor have they made any mechanical inspections of any of the systems contained herein. No, you cannot represent a client and do that kind of stuff. Do me a favor, Vic. Run through, let me know if I'm going to like it. Like, see if the heat kicks on. See if the air kicks on. Is that working? No. Any repairs required by this agreement will be completed in a workmanlike manner. Again, the most loosey goosey words ever created. <laughs> Brokers have provided or may provide services to assist unrepresented parties in complying with this agreement. What does that mean? 
broker or brokers have provided or may provide services to assist unrepresented parties in complying with this agreement. Five forms of representation. Think back, what form are we talking about? Transactional license. Agents with Keller Williams, Philadelphia, we do not practice that. <laughs> Defaults. This is really important, nobody knows this. After COVID, my husband's sitting next to me in the kitchen and I'm on the dining room table, can verbatim do a paragraph 26. Understand paragraph 26. In termination, return of deposit. The buyer terminates this agreement pursuant to any rights granted by this agreement. Buyer will be entitled to the returning of deposit monies paid on the account a purchase price pursuant to the terms of paragraph 26 B, and this agreement will void. Termination of this agreement may occur for other reasons, giving rise to claim by buyer and or seller for the deposit monies. Just because one terminates doesn't mean one or the other's getting it all the time. So they did this, and so now my seller's entitled to that money. No. Stop being so emphatic that you seem to know what you're talking about, because you don't know what you're talking about. No one is designated entitled, even though this contract says over and over and over, paragraph 26, and all deposit monies will be returned to the buyer according to paragraph 26. There are so many dangling participles to that. It is not a blanket statement. Termination of this agreement occurs for other reasons given rise to the claim of buyer and seller for the deposit money. Regardless of the, regardless of the apparent entitlement of deposit monies, Pennsylvania law does not allow the broker holding the deposit monies to determine who is entitled to the deposit monies when settlement does not occur. I can't make that decision. Brokers can only release the deposit monies if, if this agreement is terminated prior to settlement and there is no dispute over entitlement of deposit monies, a written agreement signed by both prior parties is evidence that there is no dispute, mutual acceptable written agreement, or if after broker has received deposit monies, broker receives a written agreement that is signed by buyer and seller directing broker how to just to distribute some or all of the deposit monies according to the terms of a final court order, according to the terms from a prior written agreement between buyer and seller that directs the broker how to distribute the deposit monies if there is a dispute between the parties that are not resolved. Stop telling your client, oh, don't worry about it, honey, I'll get your money. No. That's not how this plays out. Buyer and seller agrees that if there is a dispute over the entitlement, nobody's agreeing here, of deposit monies that are unresolved blank days, 180 days is predetermined if you don't fill in the gap. What are we putting in the gap? If you were putting 30 days, now you say, why are you so emphatic about 30? I've had the state in many conversations say to me, for legal, it is unrealistic to do this under 30 days. 30 days is what you need to base this off of because everybody comes down and we often will have a re-meeting of the minds. But 30 days is what you want to put in there. <laughs> After settlement date stated in paragraph 4A. So we can't address any of this until after the settlement date. Or any written extension thereof or following termination of the agreement, whichever is earlier. Then the broker holding the deposit money will within 30 days. So then I still have 30 days of the receipt of the buyer's written request dispute the deposit monies to buyer unless the broker is in receipt of verifiable written notice 
that this dispute is subject to litigation or mediation. If a broker has received verifiable written notice of litigation or mediation prior to the receipt of buyer's request for distribution, broker will continue to hold the deposit monies until receipt of a written distribution agreement between buyer and seller or a final court order. Buyer and seller are advised to initi initiate litigation or mediation for any portion of the deposit monies prior to any distribution made by broker pursuant to this paragraph. Buyer and seller agrees that the distribution of deposit monies based upon the passage of time does not legally determine entitlement to deposit monies and the parties maintain their legal right to pursue litigation even after the distribution is made. Like we're not playing here, kids. Right away, if there's a dispute, file a dispute resolution with your board, which is a whole nother class. <laughs> Buyer and seller agrees that a broker who holds or distributes deposit money pursuant to the terms of paragraph 26B of Pennsylvania law will not be liable. It's not uncommon for the broker to receive a, a demand letter, is what it's called, from an attorney. I demand that you return. Yeah. Typically, when this happens, who tends to actually get the deposit money? Does it go back, typically, does it go back to the seller or the really case by case scenario? Absolutely, case by case. Because you're going to take it to a mediation is what's gonna happen. Dispute resolution is a mediation, okay? <clears throat> Buyer and seller agree that if any broker or affiliate licensee named in the litigation regarding the deposit monies, the attorney's fees and costs of the broker and licensee will be paid by the party naming them in the litigation. Litigation is really gonna have happens after dispute resolution. It is mandated in the agreement of sale that we mediate. There are attorneys who don't read this and right away want to go to court and they get in front of the judge and the judge goes, excuse me, uh, paragraph 27 of the agreement sale says that there has to be mediation. Did you mediate? Oh, you did. Case dismissed. Now they have to go back. They have to mediate. They have to play by the rules. Seller has the option to retain all sums paid by the buyer, including the deposit money, should the buyer and this is important because your buyer is going to pull the shenanigans. Fail to make an additional payment as specified in paragraph two. Even though you know you're getting out of this contract because of the home inspection, but if you are due your second deposit, you have to pay it because now you're in default. It clearly says that here. Furnish false or incomplete information to the seller, the broker, or any party identified in this agreement concerning buyer's legal or financial status, or violates or fails to fulfill and perform any other terms or conditions of the agreement, unless otherwise checked in paragraph 26J. Seller may elect to retain those funds paid by the buyer, including deposit monies on account of purchase price, or as monies to be applied for seller's damages, or as liquid damages for such defaults. Always check J. Seller is limited to retaining those sums paid by the buyer according to the deposit monies as liquid damages. We want to hold them to only deposit monies. If seller retains all sums paid by the buyer, including the deposit monies as liquid damages pursuant to paragraph 26 F and G, buyer and seller are released from further liability or obligations to this agreement is void. Broker and licensees are not responsible for unpaid deposits. Goes on to talk about mediation, Buyer and seller will submit all disputes or claims that arise from this agreement, including disputes of claims over <clears throat> deposit monies to mediation, and it explains how you do this with the board. If mediation is signed by the parties, will be binding 
any agreement to mediate dispute or claims arise from this agreement will survive settlement. There is a full release here that releases the seller, brokers, licensees, employees, officers, and partners from any issues that may arise from personal injury, property damage, consequences known as termites, wood boring insect, lead based paint, mold, fungi, et cetera, et cetera. The real estate recovery fund, the real estate recovery fund exists to reimburse any person who have obtained a final civil judgment against a Pennsylvania real estate licensee. There is a fund. I took the thousand dollar good faith deposit, went to Sugar House, put it on black right here. <laughs> Communication between the buyer and or seller. If buyer is obtaining mortgage finance, and this is important for you guys to know, Buyer shall promptly deliver to broker for buyer, if any, a copy of all loan estimates and closing disclosures upon receipt. When you submit an offer, you need to submit the cost factor for the buyer to the seller, right here, a copy of all loan estimates. How much is it gonna cost this buyer to obtain this property? You get that from the loan officer. Wherever this agreement contains a provision that requires or allows communication or delivery to the buyer, that provision shall be satisfied by communicating and delivering to the broker for the buyer. Except for documents required to be delivered pursuant to paragraph 16. If there is no broker for the buyer, those provisions may be satisfied only by communication and delivery being made directly to the buyer, unless otherwise agreed by the party. Wherever this agreement contains a provision that requires or allows communication to the seller, that, permission, that provision shall be satisfied by communicating or delivering to the seller. We're talking about FISBOs. We're talking about a buyer who represents themselves and does not have representation. <laughs> Paragraph 31, heading. This section of the paragraph headings in this agreement are for convenience only and not intended to indicate all of the material in the section which follows that they shall have no effect whatsoever to determine the right obligation or intent of the party. Special clauses. Please note there are four options. Sale and sale of another property with a contingency. Sale and sell, settlement of another property contingent with a right to continue marketing. Sale and settlement of another property contingent with a time kickout clause. Settlement of the other property contingent. When you are contingencing an agreement that their own property has to sell, it's a contingency. I got to sell where I live to move forward. You must read all four of these to determine which of these addendums work in tandem with the needs of your buyer. Appraisal contingency, short sale. What other contingency? has customarily been found that we added here. Top, excellent. Even though on page two, top is indicated that you're gonna check it off, you can also add it again here as a reiteration. How about your escalation clause that we use a lot, right? Okay, additional terms. Listen, you are not an attorney. <clears throat> Even though you slept at the Howard Johnson's, you are not an attorney. So be very careful how you add verbiage here. If you need to add verbiage, maybe, just maybe, you run it by then. And let's make sure we're doing it correctly. Buyer and seller acknowledge receipt of the copy of this agreement at time of signing. Not always do people sign electronically. There is something known as wet signature. That is done with a real pen sitting across the table from a real person, okay? You need to bring a copy of this agreement so they have it. Not everyone is computer savvy and or have the wherewithal. 
This agreement may be executed in one or more counterparts. What does that mean? You can have two separate identical copies. So, Mr. Jones is in London for work. He will be signing electronically. Mrs. Jones stayed home with the kids and the cat, and she can't even turn a computer on, let alone operate a cell phone. She's only one step below me. Of which, you have to drive over there and have her sign. You have a wet signature sign on one day and an electronic signature another day. That is okay. That is acceptable. Okay, that's counterparts, each of which shall be deemed to be an original and which counterpart together shall constitute one and the same agreement of the parties. Notice to the parties, when signed, this agreement is a binding contract, novel concept. Parties to this transaction are advised to consult a Pennsylvania real estate attorney before signing if they desire legal advice. Returning of this agreement and any addenda and amendments, including return by electronic transmission, bearing the signature of all parties constitutes an acceptance by the party. The buyers received consumer notice, received an estimate of closing costs, and received deposit money notice. Buyer has received a lead-based paint disclosure. Sign, sign. Your seller has received a consumer notice and has received an estimate of closing costs. May you go in peace. <laughs>